On this Native Report, we highlight Jenny Van Sickle, a City Council member who has been leading the Wisconsin Point land transfer proposal with the officials from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. This proposal will return Wisconsin Point's sacred burial ground back to the band. And then we see how in Seattle, Washington, a group is helping the members of their urban Native community combat homelessness. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders. Production for Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, Anishinaabe Fund, and Alexandra Smith Fund in support of Native American treaty rights administered through the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. The generous support from viewers like Jack and Sharon Kemp. DSGW Architects, personalizing architecture online at dsgw.com and viewers like you. Welcome to Native Report and thanks for tuning in. I'm Rita Karpinen. In this episode, Jenny Van Sickle, the first Native American to serve on the Superior City Council, has been leading the Wisconsin Point land transfer proposal with the Fond du Lac Band officials. Van Sickle believes there is a responsibility to respect these lands and make sure they are returned to Ojibwe people. The work we're about to accomplish is historic on behalf of people we have never met and their relatives who we also may never meet. My name is Jenny Van Sickle and I am Klingit Athabaskan Sheetkakwan Kiksadi Yeh Gajahin. And that means my people are from the water, that my clan house is raven, and my uh, crest is frog, and I'm from the sun house. I'm Klingit, which is coastal, and um, on my um, grandfather's side, I'm Athabascan, which is more interior. You know, the Klingit people have been settled in Alaska since the beginning of time. I am a city councilor here in Superior, Wisconsin. I am born and bred in the Pacific coastal waters of Alaska. That is, that is my home, that is always my home. Especially in public service, Native people, Native perspective, Native language, Native experience is often treated as optional. There is a responsibility to understand the history of the land you live on and how the generations of decisions and development have impacted a people. In 2017 was the very first time the city of Superior had ever recognized Indigenous Peoples Day in 2017. So it starts to come into focus um, that there are probably a lot of stones unturned um, or that people would start coming to you about tribal matters, even though I'm not Ojibwe or I'm not indigenous to Wisconsin or what is now called Wisconsin. So making sure that you're not speaking on behalf of all native people or all Alaskans, just trying to broaden the lived experience of a council that is underrepresented um, dramatically by, by uh, women, women of color, certainly indigenous people. Um, and we still have a lot of barriers to break down. We have a lot more firsts to get to. So every year, a local radio station hosts a medallion hunt. Innocent fun. But however the clues were worded or whatever, there was a substantial and upsetting miscommunication with the contestants and the people that were looking for this hidden medallion. And somehow they ended up on Wisconsin Point, rooting through the sacred burial ground out there. Wisconsin Point is a part of the area that I represent. I, I was outraged, and a lot of people were to varying degrees. 
but it felt like it was an area that had been underprotected for a long time. Our police department, they went out there right away. They, you know, protected the site um, in that way. And, and then the radio station, they did the right thing. They called the hunt off um, and apologized. I think they were upset by it too. To me, it just demonstrated a larger disregard for the area and for the history. So after that happened, I was, I think, really frantic to find a way to respond and um, to talk about it on a larger scale and how, as a city, we could do better. And so I came up with this idea to change the name of the road. I had already not been calling it Moccasin Mike Road. You know, in our documents and our discussions, I would usually write MM or something like that. I thought that I needed to address some larger misunderstandings or the way that mockeries of Native people, whether it's in your Saturday morning cartoons or in Hollywood now, um, Moccasin Mike just really seemed to personify that. And I thought if people could go down there and have that narrative change, that maybe they would enter the point with a little bit more reverence or a pause. There was a larger movement happening in the United States where different companies were changing, um, you know, beloved faces or names. I suggested this name change in, in the middle of that. And um, I think it really helped focus people's ire to something local, something that, that was theirs. I spent the next few days just reading hundreds and hundreds, well over a thousand comments online, just tearing me apart. I wasn't even native and I wasn't even from here and I should go back to where I came from. In the middle of all of that, Fond du Lac reached out. They had the wherewithal to say like, all right, like I think this is a person that is clearly determined to do something. Um, let's give her some direction. Let's work on something together. And Fond du Lac agreed the name was totally nonsense and obviously not a native person, but they really had their, their own vision of how the city could be a partner. You know, I think that was March of 20, 21. From that moment on, I, of course, full pivot. Fond du Lac had goals around Wisconsin Point. Then I was just totally on board to, to get that done, no matter how long and difficult that process would be. By July of that year, I had done enough research. I had done enough just collection of all of these articles. I had to find the deeds that were in a firm somewhere in Milwaukee. I spent months researching and having conversations with the State Historical Society. There were so many people willing to help what Fond du Lac had stated as a clear goal, and that was to return the sacred burial grounds at Wisconsin Point to the band. You know, I met with a lot of descendants. I really learned the history, and it was just very human. These were people standing right in front of me. It was important to understand the city's role, that it wasn't some vague slight against Native people. It was a deliberate decision by leaders in Superior at the time to appeal a court's decision about that burial ground and fight the tribe and fight tribal sovereignty and ownership to make sure that U.S. Steel could build there. This particular site is on Wisconsin Point. It is the old uh, Wisconsin Point Cemetery. Uh, most of the people that were buried there had indigenous ascent, generally Lake Superior Ojibwe. About a hundred years ago, the city of Superior, in the hopes of developing the area, decided to seize that that property uh, from the owners of the people that had been living on the point. They exhumed the graves, and when we say mass grave, it's because the people that were exhumed did not get individual graves in the new burial place, which was along the Namaji River. Uh, so that's that, by any definition, would be considered a mass grave, and you know, in the modern world, would be.
considered an actual crime against humanity. And then it turned into also working with the folks at St. Francis to also then include in the work, not only would we return the burial ground, but that we would work with the folks at the church to make sure that we could also return the, the site of where they were reinterned um, in, in a mass grave off of their property. Because there had been this narrative that it was that they were moved to a, a Catholic cemetery and they weren't. It was a city cemetery at the time. What you are approving today is transferring the deed, actual ownership to the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe. Uh, it is a, a precedent to the process to eventually enter it into federal trust and conceivably make it reservation land. Uh, but this is this would formally trans give your authorization to transfer to the band. This has been a very long and difficult process, and I also just want to say thank you to Allison Johnson, who is not here tonight, but um, also the council, um, the councils that have come before us, um, the council of last year who started this phase of it and the, the representatives and the senators, the descendants, the tribal nations that have reached out in support. Um, we, have, we have had such an incredible opportunity to uh, build on their work. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Motion carries. At the end of the day, you know, the burial ground itself was 0.2 acres and people had spent over a hundred years trying to get back 0.2 acres. Fond du Lac's flag over there in the corner, it's only been in this room for a year and you know we had a ceremony to, to, have them, to have them planted here. Over here we have a map on the wall, the mayors used to be on that wall, but now we have a full indigenous language map of this area because this building is a part of something bigger and I think that the people that work here can always strive um, to have better representation in not only our staff but our policies. In a future episode we will show you the celebration of the reclamation of sacred burial grounds back to the Fond du Lac Band. Presbyopia is the gradual decline in close-up vision. It's an inevitable part of aging and tends to sneak up on us. It begins in your mid-40s and continues to worsen into your mid-60s. You start to hold reading material farther out to keep the letters in focus. Eventually, your arms just aren't long enough. Close vision becomes blurry and the eye strain can cause headaches. Dim lighting makes it worse. Reading glasses can help if you've had good vision otherwise. I wore dollar store readers for years and had them balanced on the tip of my nose. My wife thought they looked ridiculous. The eye is an amazing organ and we tend to take its miraculous abilities for granted. The ocular lens is inside the eye and is shaped like the lens of a telescope. The lens has a muscle ring around it that curves the lens to help us focus on close objects. The lens hardens with age and can't change shape as easily. The biggest risk factors for presbyopia is age. Almost everyone has some degree of it by age 40. Diseases such as diabetes, multiple sclerosis, or cardiovascular disease can increase your risk of developing presbyopia. Certain medications can also increase the risk. Presbyopia is diagnosed with a basic eye exam. The eye doctor will likely put drops in to dilate your pupils so they can see into your eyes better. They'll use various lenses to find your best vision. Treatment for presbyopia can be eyeglasses, contact lenses, or refractive surgery that could include lasers or implants. A healthy lifestyle is essential for the health of your eyes. Keeping diabetes and blood pressure in control, eating a healthy diet, regular exercise, and preventing eye injuries with safety glasses and sunglasses are all important. Quitting or reducing smoking, alcohol, and drug use will help your life in many ways. Talk to your healthcare provider about your eye health. It's a beautiful world out there and seeing it clearly is a gift. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio, and this is Health Matters. Washington State is home to the Chief Seattle Club, which has supported urban natives in need for help for decades. 
We learn more about how they have recently opened a new housing facility to further help the needs of their community. They're valiant. Uh, they have been separated from their lands and waters where they grew up, their people, and they find themselves on the streets. <laughs> I've been out here for over seven years. When the Alaska Way Viaduct was still here, I slept under oh, that. It sucks to be cold. And they are tough and resilient. How they do it is beyond me. I'm not that tough. I'm not that brave. And so it's um, concrete and doorways and little camps off the freeway. It's just tough and dangerous. And people ask, uh, well, can't they go home, you know? Wouldn't they want to go home? And my own feeling is, yes, they would, but they can't. Too much has happened, too much water under the bridge. And things happened that sometimes drove them away from home, things that are hard for them to carry. And so they end up on the streets. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm Julie Codd. I was uh, uh, born and raised in Spokane and, and, and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace actually 60 years ago <laughs> this year. I think it started in 1970, early 70s. So I took it 20 years later. So I was just, the, I, carry, I carried it on and I, I felt like it was a, a baby <laughs> really because I, it started and I just uh, nurture, nurturing it and it just, um, you know, to see it now and, and see it, what's, what it's doing, I feel like this is where it's got to be. I had, I had a hard time letting go of letting, saying this is not my baby anymore. It's, it's grown and it's fantastic and it's thriving and it's the, it, the people are running it. So <laughs> that is, that thrills me. That's just what, it's, what it was meant to do. So the Chief Seattle Club is a home for our native or urban native relatives. Um, you know, in this city, in most urban centers, Native Americans don't really have places they, they can call their home that have true native essence, true native, true native spirit. Yummy, 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 they'll be loving my tummy. Thank you very much. In the fact, a lot of places, um, it's the opposite of that. It's just constant reminder of colonization, of what was taken away from you. What, what doesn't belong to you anymore. And as Native people, that's what we see and feel when we're in these urban centers. What Chief Seattle Club is provides a home, a place that's truly for Native people, a place where they can feel that it is their home. It is a place where they're loved. It is a place where they, have, they are belonged. They, they, they're wanted, they're accepted, a place where they can thrive. And so, um, yeah, that's what Chief Seattle Club means. About um, two or three years ago, we opened um, a center called Eagle Village down in the Industrial uh, Valley. The county was able to buy trailers uh, that had been um, used by oil workers in North Dakota, and then when the oil boom crashed, uh, the trailers were useless, and so the county was able to buy them for very little money, and we remodeled them. It's uh, now temporary housing uh, for about 32 people. This housing has helped me and give me the less stress in life about worrying about where I'm going to go to sleep or where I'm going to go to, go to earth, eat or whatever, you know. And it gives me time to look for something I can afford, which is real hard here in Seattle. We opened up all, all. We, we totally transitioned all them and now they're into permanent units here in this building. And um, we've got another 29 people off the streets in there, right? So we're going to kind of like use that as a temporary holding as we're building up more housing. We'll, we'll, we'll move the, transition them into our housing projects and, and try to get more people off the streets into our shelter program. I really appreciate how, how they run this, run Eagle Village. It's quiet. It's, 
a lot of nice people here. The main thing we provide here is a social hub, is a community, is a sense of, like I said, a place where you actually have a sense of belonging, to know that you go here, you come here, and it is your space. It's just as much your space as it is mine, and we're here for each other. Um, they don't have that, that, that um, relationship with other organizations, with other places. You can't walk into a public library and feel like you wanted and belong, right? Um, that's what we provide, a sense of family, a sense of community and bringing our people together. Because we know that we're not gonna heal each other individually one at a time. We have to heal our community as a whole. And um, that's what we're trying to do. This is my favorite. Oh, I love this. Ready? It's my happiness. It's my, um, it's my peace of mind. Through my trials and tribulations, I was, felt I was a nobody. And I was to the last step of committing suicide and so I don't dare do that think that thought anymore but that's how low I got in life I gave up it's my accomplishment I'm very grateful that has given to me I love it because I'm never given that chance um, and being from living in Eagle Village for three years finding myself in in their shelter um, if you see me starting and if you see me now, it took three years for me to come back to presentable like there's nothing wrong with me. It shouldn't be that way. With a lot of grooming from this place, I've learned rules. I've learned how to be hygienic, how to appreciate what I got, and just how to be very thankful for, for what I have. In terms of new housing, we are just uh, now taking over a project out on Aurora near the zoo, and that's for elders. It's a brand new building, beautiful building, uh, great location. So in terms of the native community, I mean, we're talking about a really huge impact. This club has been good, good to me for over seven years. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> I guess that should tell me that dreams can happen if somebody perseveres. And the club, from those earliest efforts, you know, with Father Talbot and then Sister Julie and, and Janine and all the staff and then keeping going and Colleen and, and Derek and uh, they just keep rolling. And um, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Not only are they providing a place to live, but they give their residents a sense of community and belonging. This is the reason we do what we do. Is, is for our for our our, our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, and um, this little guy. I hope he grows up strong, knowing who he is, because you need to know who you are. You need to know who you came from, because um, if you don't, then then you can't develop into into the person who you want to be. It's so important for, for our youth to reclaim who they are as Indigenous people. And it's also important to continue to do um, the hunting, fishing, and gathering because that's based in, in who we are as a people. It's our treaty rights and it's, it's kind of the reason we retain our sovereignty as, as Native nations. We need to teach our young people they um, finish the job that started because so many times um, uh, practices are started and they're not finished in the right way. So you always put your tobacco out before you start doing something. You always clean up after yourself. You, you make sure you have left no trace out, out uh, when, when you're finished. So if you're doing a sugar bush that you've taken everything down.
and and ha- haven't wasted any of the sap that you collected because it is the life blood of our mother earth If you missed a show or want to catch up online, find us at nativereport.org and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram for behind the scene updates. And drop a comment on social media if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for spending time with your friends and neighbors from across Indian Country. I'm Rita Karpinen. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Production for Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, Anishinaabe Fund, and Alexandra Smith Fund, in support of Native American treaty rights administered through the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. The generous support from viewers like Jack and Sharon Kemp, DSGW Architects, personalizing architecture, online at dsgw.com and viewers like you.